Let's get started on marketing must-do tasks for 8A firms um, and small businesses if you want to win end-of-the-year contracts. But really, this week, I'm focusing on 8A small businesses. If you watch my earlier training, there's a lot of money that is spent at the end of the year in 8A sole source. 50% uh, of the dollars, 67% of the activity happens in the fourth quarter for 8A sole source contracts. And I really just wanted to focus this week on teaching around that. The thing that people need to keep in mind is that uh, buyers buy from those they know, like, and trust, right? People work with those they know, like, and trust. In marketing, what we're going to be talking today about, marketing helps people know, like, and trust you. Obviously, uh, knowing the fact that they begin to even know that you exist and who you are, who your company is, but then through the activities and the things you share, et cetera, they begin to like and trust you and see you as a subject matter expert, um, your firm as a firm that uh, can come in as a trusted advisor, if you will. One thing I will tell you is that I never share secrets. I don't actually believe there's any secrets in government contracting. I think that um, there is just fundamentals to success. And that's what I teach. That's what I'm going to teach today as we go through today's training. I'm going to cover down on three topics for uh, today's training around marketing must-do tasks. The first thing is I want to talk to you about the six must-have uh, marketing assets for every government contractor. Second thing I want to talk about is how you can uh, rise above your competition, what you can do to rise above your competition when buyers are looking for vendors like you. And then the third thing we're going to talk about is how to get your marketing assets proactively in front of buyers and teammates, especially during this fourth quarter, um, so they can know you exist and, and know where you might fit into their requirements and their needs. Um, if you don't know who I am, my name is Neil McDonnell. I'm the president of the GovCon Chamber of Commerce, and I want to welcome you to my federal sales training where I provide tips for success in the federal market. I spent 20 years in the federal market as a small business owner, and since 2018, I've been teaching people like you that government contracting is not a secret. It's just a process. When we follow a process A to Z, we're going to have repeatable, predictable results, and that's what I want for you. Um, I want you to uh, just keep in mind as we're going forward in the training, engage in chat. If you're open to connecting with LinkedIn or on LinkedIn, let people know. I don't just provide an environment where I'm teaching and I'm, I'm talking to you about the process, but I also provide you a community um, uh, where you can network virtually with so many people. And if you can look and start talking to some of the folks in here, probably the ones who've been in the chat early from the start of today's session, that many people have found potential teaming partners and certainly industry friends within the community. So definitely engage them. That has nothing to do with me. That has to do with you just walking up to somebody virtually and saying hi, right? So it begins with letting people know if you're open to connecting on LinkedIn, et cetera, because many people will begin to reach out to you. Um, and the last thing is just make sure you put your core competency and your company name into the chat. Just two or three words to describe your core competency will help me um, help others in the industry and help buyers remember who you are. If you were here yesterday and even the day before, you'll see federal buyers are in our training. They'll comment in the chat occasionally. I think Dave Waltz from the Navy yesterday was talking about uh, this is who he's looking for. Small businesses, this is who he's looking for. And he was also saying, hey, we got this source of sock. Come look at it. So he might even put it in today. I can't see the chat. But if he's here and he says that, you'll get my point. Um, you want to make sure Dave knows who you are and the others know who you are through just simple keywords that make it easy for us to remember. Um, if you're coming in a little late, my tech's off today, so uh, I'll give you the training. This is how I did, you know, 200 plus trainings um, earlier in the in the year, et cetera. But usually lately I've been using slides, just my slides aren't working for some reason. So we're moving through the training. So let's talk about the six must have marketing assets um, for every small business and 8 firms in particular who are trying to get end of the year spending, you need to have these squared away, right? So the first one is your small business profile. Your small business profile is made up of SAM and DSBS. The purpose of the small business profile is to get you found. We talk about um, these marketing assets are all about visibility. We want to make sure that, uh, or findability, right? We want to make sure that people can find you. We say we want you to be findable and attractive. And what that means is you're findable through your keywords and you're attractive when your company marketing materials is matching the search intent of the federal buyer. So if they're looking for a company that does um, cybersecurity or zero trust and they type in zero trust, well, when they show up and they look at your marketing assets, your small business profile, it should scream that we are a cybersecurity firm and we didn't just put zero trust in there with a thousand other keywords. That makes sense, right? 
So your small business profile is one of the biggest mistakes 8A firms and small businesses make across the board in government contracting because we tend to fill it out when we start a business and then we forget about it. We rarely go back except for to refresh it and say, yeah, we're still in business kind of thing. But it is the number one market research tool, the dynamic small business search together with Sam, the original registration part, right? So you need to go in there and update it. And the, the three big fields you're really trying to pay attention to um, are the keywords and narratives which get you found. So um, keywords are just really literally what it says, zero trust, cybersecurity, et cetera. And then the capability narrative fields, there's two of them basically, but they're the ones that answer the question, what do you do? So you want to make sure those are filled out. And then at the bottom, you want to make sure you have good past performance. So that's the first marketing asset. Um, and by the way, I'm saying these in the order of importance, certainly with the beginning ones, don't do anything else if you don't have your small business profile squared away, because that's where federal buyers are taught that they can find small businesses like yours. They're not taught, go to Google and, and search the entire internet. They're saying, go here to DSBS, because these are small businesses who have registered to sell to us in the government. All right, second, um, second uh, marketing asset is your capability statement. Your capabilities statement's purpose is to get a meeting. So if your DSBS profile, your small business profile is designed to get you found, your capability statement is designed to get you a meeting. That's its whole job. It's not um, to do anything else. And I describe uh, two ways of looking at your capability statement to know if you've got it done right. First, it needs to be in a Z format. And the second is it needs to be a six second read. So going backwards, a six second read, what that means is that somebody needs to look at your capability statement and in six seconds, basically know everything about your company, right? That they're going to know about it. So, uh, and then let me talk to you how that's done through the Z format. Top of your header, it has your tags. We're taught, don't lead with our tags, but your capability statement should lead with your tags. That's one of the most important things. If you're an 8A firm, you got stars three or something, and we call it a we call it bury in the lead. When you take that information and put it down low, you're making them work too hard to like you. But if they come across and they see that you're in, um, you've got a cage code, a DNS, and you've got, or a, excuse me, a UEI, and then you've got um, your uh, your tags in there, maybe a top contract vehicle, they see that really fast. And then coming down, they see your core competencies and your past performance, so they can instantly say. This is what we sell and this is who has paid us for it. So that means you can trust us too. And then on the bottom part of the Z is just the, uh, the less important information, your contact information and your NAICS code. I have whole separate trainings on that, which is why I'm moving fast through it. But you need to make sure your capability statement is in a Z format and that it can be read and understood in six seconds. Your third one is your website. So if your capability statement is just to get a meeting, right? Your website's designed to inform and to teach. If somebody comes in there and they're looking to see what your company does, usually someone's not gonna land on your website, despite all this search stuff, they're really not gonna land on your website unless they want to. So they're gonna come to your website and do some due diligence, look at your company to see if you match uh, their intent, what they're looking for. And so that's that inform part. You're informing them what you sell. Here's our products, here's our services, uh, here's a little bit about us. That's the inform part of your website. And then the other part is teaching. So this is where you would have a blog, maybe you'd have a couple of videos and you're teaching on what you're good at. So if you do zero trust, for example, you might say, hey, here's a blog of the top five things federal agencies should uh, consider when implementing a zero trust strategy or whatever, right? The idea is that's the idea of teaching. You're trying to teach your customers while at the same time, letting them know that you're the expert, right? So the important thing to remember about your website, which I find is a mistake on 80% of people's websites, is make it very easy for the government market researcher to find three things, your cage code, your UEI, and your capability statement. Everything else is uh, second level importance, but those three are really important. So again, don't bury the lead. Uh, the, the cage code, the UEI, put them on every single footer or header, right? But every single page, put them in the footer. Capability statement, you could almost do that same thing. Put it in the, the top menu system or put it in the footer, but somehow put it on every page. Why make it so hard for somebody to uh, download your capability statement, right? Or to do more research about your company on DSBS or FPDS by using your cage code in your UEI. So that third marketing asset is the um, website and its purpose is to inform and to teach. 
So coming down, I, I'm getting creative with the way I state the purposes here, but I'm trying to make each one a little bit different. Um, so the next one is your LinkedIn profile. When somebody is thinking about working with you, when you reach out to schedule a meeting, any of these things, they're gonna come back and look at your LinkedIn profile. You're here, most of you, on LinkedIn right now. That means you have a LinkedIn profile. If you say, hey, I'm interested in connecting, then we're gonna go look at your profile and go, do I wanna connect it? You know, does it make sense? A lot of us will just connect with you because you're in this training and we feel like you're learning the same processes. But the whole purpose of a LinkedIn profile really is to help establish a connection. It's that beginning part of a um, starting and building a relationship, right? This is where somebody comes in and they look and they say, oh, this is what this person does. This is what their company does, which goes on to the fifth asset, which is your LinkedIn company page. So you have a personal profile and your company page. The purpose of the company page is really more like the website, right? Its purpose is to inform and then redirect back to the website. Uh, you don't really need to teach on the LinkedIn um, company page because you're trying to drive people back to your website. If you've got a good marketing set of activity at certain points, then you'll be collecting email addresses of people who begin to come to your website. So your LinkedIn company page, it should be tied together with your LinkedIn profile, um, but its purpose is just to inform about the the company, maybe sharing some um, posts that you're doing on your personal profile, you can reshare them on your company page, but then redirecting people back to your website so they can see your expertise, the way you laid it out on your website where you were informing and teaching. The last uh, marketing asset, so these six marketing assets, the last one is called the capabilities briefing deck. And the whole point of it is not to inform, it is not to teach, right? That was old school thinking. The purpose of a capability briefing deck is to drive dialogue and relationships. When you go into a meeting, that's the time you're bringing a capability briefing deck. And so you want that briefing deck to be something that people want to look at and go, well, let's explore this. Let's talk more about that. I always tell people, if you got an hour meeting, then you want to spend five to 10 minutes on your capability briefing deck or you know, talking to your capability briefing deck at most. You're really just trying to go through fairly fast and establish that, hey, this is our company. We've got some solid past um, or organizational maturity, right? That's a little bit about us. Here's what we sell, our high level core competencies. And then here's where we've done the work before. But what I really wanna do is dive into questions, right? So the capability briefing deck is to just do a little bit of um, door opening of the dialogue. I want to dive into the discussion. So you got to keep that in mind with that last asset that it is not to inform. Your job is to inform or your website, but your capability briefing deck is really to just drive the conversation. If you're in a meeting, you want to be having a sales call, not doing a presentation about your company. All right. So those are the six marketing um, assets. By the way, uh, if you want these slides, I can definitely copy them and send them to, to whoever wants them. So just put that into the uh, chat. I'll send you the slides afterwards because I'm not sharing them right now because uh, I have a hiccup with my tool. Let's talk about how you can rise above your competition in your buyer's eyes. So this is the second thing for today's training that I want to talk about. It's one thing to have your six marketing assets, but how do you rise above your competition in the buyer's eyes when they're doing market research, et cetera? So I'm gonna, I've am gonna. i got several suggestions, um, six of them, that all come around this same idea of, of uh, removing friction from uh, your buyers getting to you. So the first tip I have, if you want to rise above your competition is to use more keywords. And this in particular is really important with the dynamic small business search. Uh, when you go into the dynamic small business search, people are using keywords to find you, right? Sometimes somebody will say they'll search on a NAICS code, but anybody who has ever searched on a NAICS code realizes the results that come back are hundreds and thousands of results. You don't want that. You wanna narrow the results down when you're a market researcher. So you're gonna search on keywords. I'll give you an example of how important this is. Um, I used to do SharePoint. My last company did SharePoint. And one of the main uh, third party tools that I worked with was a company called Nintex. Made a lot of money working with them selling their licenses and, and doing the services. When I go into um, DSBS right now and I type in Nintex, of 300,000 companies, only four companies come back and say that they do uh, Nintex. It's like, what are you doing? Nintex is tied directly with SharePoint and, and there's thousands of companies that say they do SharePoint in DSBS. And so it's really important to, for you to determine what keywords do you wanna be found, uh, found for. So when you think about your customer and your customer is gonna search for your company, 
what keywords would they use? And make sure you put those into your dynamic small business search uh, profile, your small business profile, and then also weave them through the rest of your assets. The second tip I have for you is um, write simple, memorable narratives. Inside of DSBS, one of the fields is called a capabilities narrative. The whole point of that field is to answer the question, what do you do? Tell me about your company. And so you want it to be simple, simple being fifth grade, eighth grade level of understanding. Don't be jargon heavy. Most market researchers are not going to really understand your business. So make it simple and then make it memorable. Uh, an example of one of the customers, and I'm hoping I get this kind of right. Well, actually, let me use my last company. So uh, we talk about SharePoint and we use SharePoint to help you uh, with communication, collaboration, consolidation and consistency. And my point is that's kind of a memorable thing. When I write it or say it in a certain way, we're helping you in, uh, improve communication and collaboration among your team, consolidating all your data and making sure there's a consistency of your processes across all of your employees, right? I weave it into the narrative I'm doing. It doesn't take you long to be able to come up with something like that. But when you do, it starts sinking into your teammates and buyers um, memory so that when they want to think about a company like yours, they're remembering. The next tip is um, write clear, relevant past performances. And this is very important for two areas. Your uh, DSPS profile at the bottom has experience and your capability briefing deck, these two places in particular. At the bottom of DSPS, it has this ability to put your past performance. And the problem a lot of people run into is they just put some generic title, often just whatever the government did, like IT support services, but that doesn't tell a market researcher anything about the work you did. Um, and then the other thing is they just put in like a contract number. Don't do that. Put in uh, the agency that you worked for. So it's easy for somebody to go, oh, you work for Missile Defense Agency, something like that. And they can also, instead of IT support services, maybe put in something like risk management framework and cybersecurity audits or something. It is not a past performance questionnaire in a proposal, which is basically a formal, formal document. It's just DSPS is just a marketing tool. However, you communicate your message. So write these clear, relevant past performances. Your past performances kind of change the names, the titles of the work so they match your core competency. That way, when somebody's coming down through your profile, they see what you do. And down below, the way you've written your experience kind of aligns. And they go, oh, these guys have been doing it a while. The next tip I have for you is write in 14 point font. Uh, this is in particular on your capability statement, mostly because of two reasons. One is uh, you want to be concise. And if you write in 14 point font, then you're going to have to get concise to, uh, because there's not a lot of room, right? The other thing is make it easier on the reader. They read hundreds of capability statements. If you can really communicate what you do concisely, then you're also giving them that bonus of looking at you, loving you for making it easy for them to read the document. Uh, I actually was working on a proposal with somebody yesterday and I was uh, like this close from saying it's eight page proposal. I was like, let's just make it 14 point font. It says no less than I think 12 or 11 point, but nothing says we can't go up. But imagine a proposal reviewer reading through proposals and they come to yours and it's 14 point font and it hits the mark, right? And it delivers it. That's the key is you got to make sure you're delivering your message that you want. But when you do it at 14 point font, I know that sounds like a simple thing, but all of a sudden you rise above your competition. They're like, man, I love this document, whether it's the capability statement or the proposal, the RFI response. I love it because it's so easy to read. Um, last two that I have is uh, use metadata. If you don't know what metadata, and I apologize, I can't share my screen to show you, but let me tell you, and hopefully you'll just follow what I'm saying. Metadata is um, basically it's file property. So if you go into a PDF and you open it up, go to file, you can do this in Word, you can do this in PowerPoint, whatever it is, go to the file menu and scroll down until you see the words properties or info, right? Click on either one of those and you will see the properties. And property examples are the file name, which you're really sure of, right? Uh, Neil.doc or PPX or, or uh, you know PDF, right? That's the file name. But then there's a title. If you ever open up a PDF in a browser, you can see how poorly people do this because it'll open up and it'll say something generic like PowerPoint template instead of what you really wanted to say. Um, but you can also add so many keywords. And the reason this is important is you can take your narratives and your keywords and put it into the metadata of your capability statement. When your capability statement is in an enterprise environment like a federal agency or a large prime, 
and they do a search from their computer and they just do a keyword on their hard drive. Hey, I'm looking for uh, an 8A firm that does this. If you have the keywords they look for in metadata, your capability statement will come first. Then your competitors will come. Your competitors do not use metadata. It's, a, uh, it's really shocking to me how little people understand metadata, including most of the government who does really poor job at this. But when you use metadata, you rise higher than your competitors. So when I'm talking about tips for it, that simple thing, forget about spending tens of thousands of dollars to brand your company, just make it easier for people to find you by using things like metadata. The last thing that you can do to rise above your competition is have a headline. If you look at my LinkedIn profile, it says government contracting is not a secret, it's just a process, right? It says a couple other things, but um, that headline is not Neil McDonald, president of GovCon Chamber. And so when people look at that, it attracts that person who's looking for a process, right? Who's, who's focused on government contracting. Well, if you're, I'm just sticking with zero trust for a second. If you're a zero trust company, you should say something in your LinkedIn headline that alludes to what you sell and what you do and how you help a customer compared to just having, you know, business developer or president of the company or something that doesn't attract uh, uh, your customer and your teammates, right? So if you do a headline that is simple to understand and people can see and go, oh, zero trust or elevator services or whatever it is you do, when they're looking at a bunch of people that they happen to see, they'll notice yours is the only one that is describing what you do and how you can help them where everybody else is just job stuff. They're not punished. They're just not looked at. Yours gets looked at. So you rise above your competition. So hopefully that tip makes sense. All of these tips though are, are, are central around what I said at the beginning is remove all friction between you and your customer. We keep putting friction in there. An example is not using keywords. Like if you use keywords, you, you grease the, um, the rail from your buyer to you. You make it easier for them to get to you. And when you remove friction, you're also avoiding what we call cart abandonment, meaning somebody starts to look at you and then ah, it's too hard. I'm out of here. Right. You know what that's like personally when you go shopping online or something. If you don't like a website, you're, you're bailing. If you don't like this thing, you're bailing. Make it easy for them to uh, find what they need and to avoid bailing on you. All right. Um, last thing I just want to talk about is how to get your marketing assets in front of uh, buyers and teammates. Some tips for you. One thing to keep in mind is today's Wednesday, the 14th. It's part of a five day series on uh, eight day end of the year spending. The tips are useful to all small businesses, but I'm focusing on eight day firms in particular. And so um, uh, what I want you to do is just go check out. You, somebody can put a link into the chat that tells you how you can find out more about the other days, the two that we already did and the two we're doing in the next couple of days. But really quickly, because I'm running out of time, here's some tips I just want you to remember. And again, tell me if you want slides. I have all this written in slides that I'll send to you. Uh, but the first thing is be in supplier portals, right? There's all sorts of agency supplier portals and large prime supplier portals. Get registered in there. I have a whole training about how to do that. Plus we have a whole directory that's free at www.govconchamber.com that you can go and download and it has the links. And so it makes it quick and easy for you to do that. Um, the second thing that I wanna uh, suggest is post your capability statement on LinkedIn. Put it into your profile, obviously, in your experience section, your feature, but consider just posting it out there. Hey, just, you know, um, you see me, I post out PDFs or et cetera. You just upload your capability statement, write a little narrative. Hey, this is how we help customers. Here's a tip of the day, whatever it is. And don't do it once. Do it every single week. Rotate the day, rotate the time. You can't do it enough because most people who come on LinkedIn are on once a week. That means if you post something, they're not going to really see it. And if people like me who follow you, I see it more than once, who cares? You want me to see it more than once. So it starts sinking it in. But once a week is not too much. But certainly anything, uh, you know, if you're not doing it once a week or if you're taking longer to do it, you just, um, you're wasting a valuable resource uh, to be able to share your profile. And um, the last tip I want to give you just quickly, because we're running out of time, I have more in here. When I give you the slides, I'll show you. But the last one I want to tell you about is engage on LinkedIn, because when you engage with other people, what I mean is give a thumbs up or post a comment in particular with relevant uh, you know, information in your comment. You know, don't just post, hey, great post, you know, tell them why. But when you engage on LinkedIn, it inspires people like me who you might have engaged with to go look at your profile and go, who's this? Let me go look. And because you have a good headline, I'm saying, oh, I want to go see the zero trust 
uh, whoever, right? And now I'm going to your profile, one of those six marketing assets, and because you made it look good, I'm learning more about your company. It's a free marketing way to reach exactly who you want to reach. So if you've got a CIO who's on here and they're posting stuff, engage with them. Eventually, they're going to go look. You know, you don't don't rush this, but engagement on uh, LinkedIn is just social selling. And I've done a whole set of training about that in the past month. Um, so, OK, just a couple of things I want you to remember as you go away from today's training. Again, I apologize for not having the slides, but happy to send them to you uh, if you just put a comment in there. But the things I want you to remember is that um, if a buyer can't quickly understand what you sell, they bolt. They're going to go to your competition. So make it easy. Remove the friction and make it easy for them. Uh, the second thing I want you to remember is I want you to proactively market yourself by reaching out and calling buyers, picking up the phone, emailing them. Uh, don't spam, but targeted outreach. And then also engaging on LinkedIn, like I mentioned. And the last thing that's it's really important for you to remember this, and I know I'm coming at you with a fire hose of information, don't overthink my recommendations. One of the things I learned as a ballroom dancer is when I'm trying to learn to dance, only improve one thing at a time, like my frame or my uh, footwork, et cetera. But if I try to do too much, I'm just overwhelmed and I can't get it into habit or memory. It's the same thing with my recommendations. Just don't overthink it. Don't, don't make uh, perfect the enemy of good. If you've ever heard that phrase, just get it done. Pick one of my suggestions and get it done. Feel good about it and then move on to the next one. I want to say thank you to the CupCon Chamber of Commerce sustaining members. Without your help, we're not able to make a lot of these things possible. Uh, so thank you. If you got value from today's training, consider becoming a sustaining member. And the last thing I want to say is if you're interested in working with me personally, I have a BD Accelerator workshop for companies that are basically $2 million and above. It's an investment to work with me at this level. Um, what I'm really looking for is 58A firms that I can support in this 90-day workshop through the last uh, quarter of this fiscal year. So if it's something you're interested in, if you're looking for some support to get you to the next level, reach out to me on uh, LinkedIn messaging and I'll get back to you. For everybody else, remember, government contracting, it is not a secret. It's just a process. I'll see you in the next training.